Welcome to uh, the 17th Annual Lake Association Summit. My name is Lauren Dye, and I'm going to be uh, facilitating this event this morning. Um, so we're going to cover the few housekeeping notes related to Zoom, which I'm think, I think everyone's probably familiar with. Um, we are asking that everyone mutes and turns off their videos, um, and we encourage you to use the chat box to ask questions. Um, if you would prefer to ask your question, your question in person, you can use the raise my hand feature that's located at the bottom of your screen. We don't have any scheduled breaks, as you can see on our agenda, we got a pretty full agenda today. Um, but this event is being recorded uh, for viewing at a later date. So if you do feel like you need to take a break and step away, feel free to do that. Um, so we will be putting a link to the evaluation. Um, survey for this event in the chat. Um, and I really want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to take that at the end of the event. Um, I wanted to share it with you now so that you have it. Um, and which I will be covering again at the end as well. Uh, we had over 60 people RSVP for this event today. Um, and so looking at the RSVP list, we have um, quite a few lake associations represented today that I wanted to recognize. We have the Black Lake Association, Black Lake Preservation Society, Burt Lake Preservation Association, Elkskigamog Lakes Association, Friends of Clam Lake, Sheboygan Area Long Lake Association, Larks Lake Association, Lake Charlevoix Association, Mullet Area Preservation Society, Walloon Lake Association and Conservancy, Preservation Association of Thayer Lake, Douglas Lake Improvement Association, Three Lakes Association, Birch Lake Association, Bass Lake Association of the Elk Rapids, and Pickerel Crooked Lakes Association. Uh, so that's a good chunk of the lake associations that we have um, within our service area. I think we have around 25, both lake and uh, river groups. Um, so we're really you know, excited to see that representation today. But if I didn't mention your lake association and you want us to recognize that you're here, please uh, feel free to, to uh, put that name in the chat. Um, next, I would like the Watershed Council staff to introduce themselves. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Lauren Dye. I am the Watershed Management Coordinator, um, and I have been with the Watershed Council for about a year and a half now. Katie, you're on mute. Good morning. I'm Katie Wolf. I'm the Executive Director, and I've been with the Watershed Council for six months. Good morning, I'm Natalie Walsh, and I'm the office manager, and I've been with the Watershed Council since 2019. Good morning, I'm Jen Buchanan, I'm the associate director, and I've been with the Watershed Council for a, nearly 19 years. Good morning, I am Jennifer McKay, I'm the policy director at the Watershed Council and have been with uh, the Watershed Council for more than 17 years. Good morning. My name is Eli Baker. I'm the Education and Outreach or Water Resource Education Coordinator at the Tip Limit Watershed Council, and I've been here since 2016. Hi, everybody. My name is Caroline Keeson. I'm the Monitoring Programs Coordinator at the Watershed Council, and I've been here for four years. I'm Noah Jansen. I have been Watershed Council since February, and I am the Restoration Coordinator. Okay, great. I think we got everyone. Um, a couple more things I wanted to mention this morning. Um, because this is the Lake Association Summit, and we do work with lake associations quite a bit. Um, we are interested in creating um, something similar to like a directory of sorts of lake associations. Um, so that you guys can share that with one another and be able to interact with one another, um, you know, outside of us. We are happy to, of course, facilitate and connect you to one another, but, you know, we thought that there could possibly be a resource for you to um, kind of use on your own outside of that. We're not quite sure what that would look like, whether um, it's an event that we host annually, um, which we did try to do this year, um, or whether we ha um, have like a listserv um, where you guys can connect that way. Um, but I just wanted to let everyone know that it is something that's on, on our minds and something that we would like to put together. Um, so if you do have any feedback on that, um, I would really appreciate it if you could email me any ideas that you have for that um, so we can work on getting something like that together. 
uh, because I feel like that would be a really valuable resource because I think the lake associations have a wealth of information on their own. Um, and so it would be really great for you to be able to connect with one another. Um, in the meantime, until we get something like that together, I really encourage everyone to attend our watershed advisory meetings that we have for all of our different watersheds in our service area. The goal of these uh, watershed advisory meetings is to implement the watershed management plans. Um, and it's a great way to connect with other stakeholders within the watershed, um, other lake associations and other groups as well. So if you are interested in being um, receiving you know, email updates on that to let you know when the meetings are, uh, see agendas, minutes, um, and be able to attend those meetings, uh, please give um, send me an email and I can get you on that listserv so that you get that information. So I do encourage that um, for everyone here in the meeting today. All right, moving on on our agenda, um, welcoming everyone this morning to our 17th Annual Lake Association Summit is Katie Wolf, Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council's Executive Director. Katie has been in her new position for a full six months, having now experienced nearly one full season of an intensive lake and stream monitoring season. She brings over 30 years of environmental science, communications, and nonprofit leadership experience to Northern Michigan. Most recently, she led education and community outreach efforts for NOAA's Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary and directed its nonprofit friends groups membership and development activities. She has also served as executive director for the Presidential National Medal of Technology and Innovation in Washington, D.C., the Michigan Humanities Council, and the headed external and headed external relations for the Consortium of, for International Earth Science Information Network as part of NASA's Earth Observation System. Early in her career, she developed the Commonwealth of Kentucky Citizens Lake and Stream Monitoring Program, Water Watch, which was recognized as the Outstanding International Environmental Education Program of the Year in Banff, Canada. Good morning, Katie. Good morning and welcome everyone. It's fun to see the numbers uh, in attendance continue to increase. Uh, first, I wanna thank Lauren Dye for an, a wonderful job in pulling this whole event together and the whole tip of the Met Watershed Council staff. Uh, they will all be involved in some capacity today. So thank you so much for the efforts you put in and particularly because our lake associations are so important to us. Um, you know, we cannot do what we do without that strong partnership. And so the more we can work with you, we can address those important needs to protect water quality. As you have all been watching the news in the past few weeks, and it continues to grow more uh, serious, is the shortage of water, the uh, extreme weather happening in the West, and we're watching the flooding in Pakistan. Uh, the Great Lakes area is definitely in full focus right now because of our abundant water resources. So it's really never been more important for us to work closely together. And you know our lake associations, I, it, it seems just pretty much a day-to-day, hand-in-hand operation with all of you. So we greatly appreciate that relationship and we're dependent on that. We, we need the partners between our volunteers and the lake associations and the important state and federal agencies that we partner with, as well as our generous donors. That's what makes the Watershed Council work. We're not a government agency. We don't have this secret big pot of money somewhere. We work really hard with our partnerships to bring the resources we can to help solve local problems. So thank you so much for being supportive. And I think the show of people here today reflects that. A couple of the things I wanna hit upon today that I haven't had a chance. I've met with many of the Lake Association so far. If I haven't been to your Lake Association, please invite me. I'd love to come and meet you these first six months. I've stayed really busy going out and trying to meet as many people as I can, as well as getting to know the staff. And so one of the things we're doing right now, um, you know, we continue to increase in the number of demands on the Watershed Council. And so we're trying to build our capacity. So please stay tuned and notice that we will be posting positions. And if you have people who are truly passionate about protecting Northern Michigan's waters, um, please share our website with them and tell them to consider coming to work with us. Um, the other thing that we'll be doing is uh, really trying to ramp up our educational outreach efforts. 
not only with school children, which is very important. We have our Watershed Academy program, which we're very fortunate that several of the lake associations helped sponsor this year and bring the Watershed Academy into your watersheds. Uh, we encourage more to do so, and we hope to grow that program. But we also hope to build it um, education opportunities for local officials and lake associations so that as people um, buy property on uh, the shorelines or uh, banks, that they come equipped with understanding the responsibility that comes with living along the water. And if you run for elected office, and hopefully we can encourage people who are knowledgeable and passionate about water quality to run for office in those leadership positions, we really wanna work with you and help you understand the best practices for protecting water quality now and for future generations. So look for those educational opportunities, but also know it's a two-way street. If you have ideas of things that we can do to better inform the public about taking good care of our waters, please reach out to us. We are open and excited to work with you. Uh, we have a great team. I'm, I'm really proud to not only have a great staff, but an incredible board. Uh, if you haven't checked out our board of directors lately, go to our website. We're really fortunate to have a, a very knowledgeable, um, experienced board, and I'm relying heavily on them as I get to know the Watershed Council. The other thing that we want to do with our education programs, in fact, in everything we do, is make sure that they're um, closely aligned with the watershed management plans. So as communities get together and define what those priorities are in their watersheds, we want to make sure that those same priorities get taken forward in the programs that we manage. And that includes when we work with our school children. When they work on projects, we want to make sure that they align with what the priorities are uh, for their watershed plans so that they get that full experience of what it means to be in sync with their community, being able to work with the lake associations and become really strong future stewards. So those are a few of the things that we're focused on right now. We're just coming out. Uh, if you see, uh, you probably have seen Caroline Keeson and our interns out to the summer. Uh, I think they paddled over 150 miles this summer going along the shorelines, doing the surveys. Um, it was an intensive survey year for us. Every three years, we have a more intensive water quality monitoring program. This year was one of those years. So um, please give them a pat on the back and uh, let them know what a great job they did in covering a lot of territory. Um, those are the things that I wanted to make sure we recognize today. I'm excited about the program. I'm anxious to hear our keynote address and obviously how we communicate with our publics is absolutely critical. Uh, we can grow our audience as if we pay attention to how we reach out to them. I'll be talking a little bit later today on some of the things we do with social media and uh, from my 30 years of experience, how you can tap into some of those efforts to build your own audiences uh, within your association. Uh, that's all I have for you today. I, please reach out to me. I want to meet you. I want to get to know you. I want to hear your concerns and uh, build a strong relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. We'll put your email in the chat as well in case anyone wants to reach out to you. All right. Our first presenter was not able to present uh, in person, so to speak, um, but they kindly provided a recording that we could share with you all. Um, we are going to be putting a link in the chat where you can submit questions specifically for this presentation um, so that I can share them with Eric and he can get back to you with those answers. So we'll go ahead and get started with that. Uh, Eric Eichel is the owner and principal at Water Words That Work, LLC and oversees all the company's client, client projects. Eric has more than 20 years experience planning and executing outreach and communications programs. Eric is a sought after conference speaker and has appeared on CNN and been quoted in the New York Times. Before starting the firm, Eric worked for Beacon Fire Consulting, American Rivers, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Environmental Law Institute. 
I'm going to go ahead and get that recording started. Hello, Michigan. I'm Eric Eckle. It's a pleasure to be with you here today, even if only virtually. Uh, as the moderator mentioned, I run a marketing and public relations firm that works with people like yourselves to save lakes, rivers, streams, oceans, estuaries. We use marketing and public relations practices, techniques for that. And I'm here today to share with you some of the things that we have learned in many years of surveys and studying what people think about why your work matters. So I am going to uh, share my screen now and uh, let's take it away. So this talk is called The World Outside, what they say, and by that I mean the public, about why your work matters. Now the reason Water Words that exist is to serve people like you and people like you are special in some ways that you might not be able to appreciate. If you're attending this conference, I bet you can make a connection between the smile on that boy's face and the condition of a wetland three or four miles upstream of the lake where they are today. If you're attending this conference, I bet you can make a connection between this fun summer afternoon for this young woman here and a uh, proposed rate increase for the water department. Most people, they can't make that connection. <clears throat> I bet if you're at this conference here today, you can make a connection between uh, what this baby here is enjoying on a, a fine afternoon and the uh, condition of the sewage treatment plant that is downstream from the tub where this baby is. Most people just can't make these connections. To be in this community, you have to have a special kind of a makeup. It takes a lot of determination to uh, take on seemingly intractable, insolvable problems like non-point source pollution, tiny amounts of pollution from a limitless number of sources. Most people just can't muster that kind of resolve. Being in the environmental community the way we are, we often deal with people at their most ignorant and their most short-sighted and their most careless. And I know it takes a toll sometimes, but it takes a special kind of person to confront that day after day after day. Now, Aldo Leopold once wrote, I'm paraphrasing, to have an environmental consciousness to walk alone through a world of wounds that no one can see but yourself. Most people, they see this and all they see is a pretty lake, and it is a pretty lake. But if you're in our world, you know that this dam right here, uh, that this lake used to be a river, and this dam right here is a clogged artery on the land. Most people have no idea of this. So the people, they're different from you. The public, they're different from you. They can't muster that resolve that you have. They don't understand the nuances the way you do, but that doesn't mean that they don't care because they do. Now, this is a survey. This is the first of many surveys I'm going to touch on in this talk. This is from the Gallup poll, the leading uh, pollster, the best known, biggest brand, biggest name polling company in the United States. And this is from last year. This is from April of 2021. And their headline was water pollution remains, this key word here, remains top environmental concern in the United States. And they use that word remains because these results right here, they get them year after year after year. How much do you personally worry about each problem? Pollution of drinking water is number one. Pollution of rivers, lakes, lakes, lakes and reservoirs is number two. And the difference between these, 3% here on a great deal, uh, 12 percent. These are all within the margin of error. These two water pollution related questions are very closely tied for first and second place. They get results like this year after year after year. Now, in 2022, Water Words at Work, my company did also another big survey that basically corroborates the Gallup's findings. We asked the question a little bit differently. We asked it this way. 
How important are these environmental issues to you, ranked from highest on top to lowest on bottom? And there's water pollution again at the top. Year after year, survey after survey, place after place, I see these same results. Roughly 80% of the public expresses at least some recognition that protecting water is important, and this is higher than any other environmental issue. That's what I see time and time and time again. So although the public can't appreciate the finer points of environmental issues the way that you do, that doesn't mean that they don't care. So please take a moment right now to turn to your neighbor, shake your hand, and thank them for all the work that they do on behalf of lakes, rivers, streams, and waters on behalf of the American people. Give yourselves uh, a moment to enjoy the gratitude for all of the work that you do. Now, you don't hear that nearly often enough, and we're going to talk a little bit about why that is. But first, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. So here is Vicki the volunteer. She's a junior in college, and she's majoring in biology. And she's out there with her professor, and they are doing water quality samples on a nearby stream near the campus. That's terrific. Maybe she's at Michigan State. Now, she didn't start one day and wake up and decide to commit whole hog to a biology major and water quality monitoring. Somewhere before this moment, she had an appetizer-sized serving of environmental uh, awareness. Maybe she went to summer camp, built a birdhouse, and was amazed to see the little baby birds growing up in the house that she met, built. And before she went to that summer camp, she had to hear about that summer camp. And maybe her mom's friend forwarded an email about the opportunity. Maybe she saw something about it on social media. Maybe one of her friends went to that summer camp the year before and she learned about it that way. There was a time when Vicki had no idea that any of this was going on and somehow something cut through the clutter, caught her attention, and she started down the path to where she is today. Now here's Randy the rancher. And Randy is admiring his fully restored stream running through his pasture. He's got a fence in place now to keep his cow somewhere else. The water has cleaned up. He sees fish in there like he has never seen before. And he's just feeling really great about the condition of his land. Now, Randy also probably started a little smaller than that. As we all know, a full-on stream restoration is a major commitment. He probably started with an appetizer-sized serving of conservation as well. Maybe he just began rotating his cattle through his pasture uh, as recommended by the conservation district and was pleased to see how his pastures rebounded. But even before that appetizer size serving of conservation, he had a first exposure somehow. Maybe he got a newsletter from the conservation district, or he walked by a booth at the farm auction that the conservation district was there. There was a time when Randy the rancher was 100% focused on raising cattle and getting them to market and never had really thought about the condition of his land and what he could do about it. Now here is Senator Bob Blowhard, and he is taking credit for the money in the farm bill that paid for this restoration project right there. Now, Senator Blowhard is a good man, and he legitimately deserves some credit for the farm bill, but we all know how politics works. Who really did the heavy lifting? It's her right over there, Sally the staffer, the staffer who wrote the budget provisions and wrote the language in the bill. Sally, the staffer who negotiated behind the scenes, who rolled the logs and twisted the arms. This is really her day, but in the norms of political culture, she makes very careful, makes very sure that it's her boss that gets all the public credit. Now, Sally also probably started a little smaller, maybe an appetizer size serving of conservation for her. What might that look like? Maybe a few years ago, she was an intern 
and Senator Blowhard was Representative Blowhard, and marching into the office was the local chapter of the Isaac Walton League, who were uh, dismayed at the poor condition of their of their property. And young intern staffer did a little bit of homework and figured out what she could do to help them. And a year later, Sally and Representative Blowhard were at the grand reopening of the Bob Blowhard Historic Shooting Range. And she felt that sense of accomplishment and it whetted her appetite to do bigger and better things for our waterways. But in order even for that uh, appetizer size serving of conservation to occur, Sally had to get her attention. The Isaac Walton League that came into their office had to make a presentation. They had to make a positive first impression. They had to tell a good story that she understood and she related to as she saw an opportunity for her to be of to be helpful. So now these stories are all different, but they all unfolded the same way. And I bet your own stories here in that room also unfolded more or less the same way. It starts with some kind of first exposure to conservation. Let's be real, there was a time when I, you, everyone in this room had no idea about all of the things that you are spending your time on here at the conference and when you go back home to your home lakes. So there was some first exposure that almost certainly led to some first taste of conservation, some appetizer size serving of conservation that led to a change of heart. You felt empowered to make a difference, you felt determined to make a difference, and you wanted a bigger feeling and found yourself here in this room, contributing in this conference and working hard to save your lake. You didn't start here, almost certainly you started there. So why don't we have more stories like Sally the Staffer and Randy the Rancher and Vicki the Volunteer? Well, there are some places along this chain where things tend to go wrong for the conservation community. And one of the first places here is that first exposure. As a community, we are very weak at getting in front of people for the very first time. Our community is stubbornly, stubbornly determined to try and make that first impression at some kind of a public event. And that's a great high quality way to make a first impression, but we have no control over how many people come to these events, what kind of people come to these events, but it's familiar and comfortable us and we are uh, very intense as a community about participating in these public events and meeting people face to face. Terrific. But in 2022, most of us are forming our first impressions of just about everything on some kind of screen. And our community is not very thoughtful about how do we get ourselves on the screen in front of somebody's eyeballs who hasn't heard of us before. That's an area of weakness for us. Another uh, place where things go wrong is at that first taste, that appetizer size serving of conservation. Many of you here got your first serving of conservation out on the lake or out on the woods with your dad or your grandpa or your family and you had a immersive high quality first exposure to nature at a very deep level. That's great, I wish people still did that the way we used to do, but the world has changed. We uh, try to substitute for that with educational workshops. We teach, we love to have nature workshops for kids and teach them to count the bugs or sample the water or plant the trees. And these are also great, but what do these things have in common? That is a big commitment, a rare opportunity that many people growing up in our society simply never had and never will. These in-person field events can be very formative for a young person, but they're a big commitment. They have to drive some distance to participate in this event. It's on the date and the time that you choose for them rather than the date or the time that they choose for themselves. And these kinds of in-person experiences really limit how many people can get involved in the beginning. 
because in 2022, many people's first taste of making a difference, again, it starts on some kind of screen. It starts by clicking some kind of a button, clicking a donate button, clicking a take action button, clicking a subscribe button, clicking a uh, event RSVP button is where so many things begin, conservation included, in 2022. So now water is the top environmental concern in the US and it has been for a very long time. So what does that mean for all of us? And I bet if I was in the room with you, I would see a lot of puzzled looks right now. It doesn't really feel like water pollution is their top environmental concern right now, does it? And some of you might be asking, does the Gallup survey mean that they want to know who's looking out for their water? If they care so much about water, how come they've never heard of us before? Well, let's talk about what surveys say about that. This is a survey from Responsive Management, which is a uh, market research firm, a very high quality firm that focuses on conservation issues specifically. And they did a survey in the Southeastern United States. Southeastern United States, where higher percentages of people hunt and fish than anywhere else in America. There are more hunters and fishers in, as a percentage of the population in the Southeast than anywhere else. And yet, only 20% of Southerners can volunteer the correct name of their state fish and wildlife agency. One in five. So that means that there are many, many people who hunt and fish and they buy that hunting license, they buy that fishing license year after year. But if you ask them who is the agency that issued that hunting or fishing license, they don't know. Now here's a survey, this is an older one, but I love it so much. This was a survey of Americans outdoor recreation habits. And the question was, have you personally used public lands managed by each agency in the last 12 months? And the people who took this survey were most likely to report that they had visited lands managed by the National Park Service. And they were much less likely to report that they had visited an Army Corps of Engineers reservoir. So what's so funny about that? Well, actual visitation numbers are reversed. There are a lot more people who visit U.S. Army Corps of Engineers reservoirs than visit units of the National Park Service. What, what, what? So that means that there are millions of Americans who drive down to the Army Corps of Engineers Lake. They check into the Army Corps of Engineers campground. They put their boat on the lake at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers boat ramp. And if you come back to them a year or a week or two later and you say, have you been to a public lands and enjoyed that? They'll say, yes, I went to a national park. How can that be? How can we possibly explain that? There's only one explanation, really, and that's that they don't care. The public says that water is important, but they don't tell us that they have a whole lot of interest in who's who in our professional community. State environmental agency, federal environmental agency, county public works, national forest, state forest, watershed association, nature conservancy, this municipal coalition, that regional um, committee, they don't really care about that. They might pretend to care if they're your friends and they're looking at you in the eye, but that's just not what's important to them. Water is important to them, but the ins and outs of who's who in our community is not important to them. And so you might find yourself wondering, does the Gallup survey mean they'll stop complaining when we do something to protect the water? Well, I wish, but let's see what surveys have to say about that. So this is a survey of water utility customers. And the question was, are you satisfied with the amount of information about the quality and safety of your tap water? And 18% gave it the lowest possible score, not satisfied at all. And my hunch is they're telling us it's too much information. It's too detailed and it's too hard to follow. Meanwhile, when we ask about uh, South in the Southeast about the fish and game agencies, 
we see only 2% are very dissatisfied. Now, there is a big difference between 2% who are dissatisfied with their state fish and wildlife agency and 18% who are dissatisfied with the information that's coming out of their water utility. But the point I'm making here is that it is never, never, never zero. It is never zero because no matter how good the work is that you do and no matter how well you communicate about it, you're still going to run into people like this. I'm angry about life and I have a computer and a phone. No matter how good the work is that you do and no matter how well you communicate, you're going to run into people like this. I have an anxiety condition and a computer and a phone. The public says that water is important, but that won't stop some of them from taking their own personal issues, unloading their own personal baggage on some of us. No amount of good work or good communication is going to make that last 2% go away. Some of you might be wondering if the public cares so much about water, does that mean they're going to talk more about it? Well, and in this area, we really only have ourselves to blame. When we are trying to engage the public, a lot of times we act like this kid here. This kid here is out here fishing for the very first time. And you know what's going to happen when he gets that first nibble. He's going to yank the hook right out of that fish's mouth. And we tend to do the same thing. We tell people that we're trying to save our local lake. We get that first little hint of interest, that first glimmer, and we jump straight to water nerddom. And we start talking about watershed stewardship ethics. We start talking about phase three whips and all the bureaucratic processes. We start using words like flocculation. We go straight to the water nerddom level of discussing saving our lakes, and we yank that hook right out of their mouth, and that little glimmer of interest turns into puzzlement and disinterest. We do that ourselves. We make it hard for people to talk about water because we want them all to be water nerds like us. But that being said, we are hardly alone. So this is the state of Michigan, which has about 10 million people in it, according to the uh, U.S. Census. What does Facebook tell us about those 10 million? Well, I did a little search. I used the Facebook graph search tool, and I found that out of 10 million Michigan residents, there are 2.5 million Facebook users who are nature lovers. There are 1.3 million Facebook users who are into lakes. And there are 60,000 Michigan Facebook users interested in environmentalism. How does Facebook know this? It's the content of their posts. It's the images that they share. It's the groups that they join. It's what they like. It's at the games that they play. It's the uh, uh, all of the interactions on Facebook and on Instagram flow back to the master Facebook algorithm, and they can tell us who in Michigan is into the things that we're working. Very healthy percentage of Michigan residents think that your work is great. But as we get more and more specific, those numbers shrink and shrink. As the commitment grows, nature lover is one thing, environmentalist is a whole nother thing. Now this is my Axiom partner, and they are similar to Facebook, and then they try and predict how many people there are. This is, a, so Facebook, is information about what your online social media activity tells us. My Axiom Partner is based on your purchases, particularly your purchases with a credit card, which can all be tracked and monitored. And based on how Michigan residents spend their money, my Axiom Partner tells us there are about 3 million interested in the outdoors. Now this is super close to the 2.5 million that Facebook said. There's 1.6 million interested in green living, which is pretty close to what Facebook tells us would be especially interested in lakes. And there are 1 million interested in environmental issues. That tells me, that tells you 
that there is a lot of room in the state of Michigan for you to grow your support. I wish you could get all three million, but there are at least a million people out there who are highly receptive to the stories that you want to tell, think your work is extra important, and are predisposed to get involved if they hear from you. And so what does it mean that they say water is so important to them? If people think that water is really important, if they're worried about water, isn't that going to put some wind in our sails somehow? And the answer is yes, it does. It means that if you take your message to them, they will respond well. And I'm going to give you some examples from our work and from others' work to show you what I mean by that. Hard numbers. So let's talk about email here. This is an email from the American Red Cross. They emailed me with some regularity asking me to donate blood. And what I know from various benchmarks is that large national nonprofit organizations like the American Red Cross, like the Nature Conservancy, like uh, Komen, like, um, like CARE, like uh, Heifer International, they get about 12% of their emails get open. They send 100 emails, 12 people open it. They send 1,000 emails, 120 people open it. They send a million emails, 120,000 people own it, open it. But what about local water groups like the Katy Prairie Conservancy in Texas? How many people open their emails? What I see with local water groups, people like yourselves, is that the rate at which people open your emails is more than double the rate at which they would open an email from a national nonprofit. A local water organization, people are much more receptive. They're much more likely to open an email that they get from you than they would get from the American Red Cross or some other good cause at the national level. Let's talk about mail, nonprofit organizations in the mail. You've got the fundraising letters, you've got the postcards, you've got all those things. Rule of thumb in my business is that the open rate would be about 1%, 1%, I'm sorry, the response rate, about 1% to mail coming from a national nonprofit organization. How about water-related stuff? Well, we did a project for the city of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, a couple of years ago, and they had a street tree planting program. They wanted to reduce the amount of runoff flowing into local streams, and they were going to build trees or plant trees on your property. And all they needed is your permission to come out and plant that tree. They were convinced that Chambersburg residents were hostile to trees because very few people were taking them up on this offer. And they brought us in to see if they made a difference. And we told them, I think people just don't even realize this program is out there. And they're like, no, 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 no. They don't like trees. And we said, oh, yes, I think they just don't know you're going to plant one. And the client said, oh, no, no, I don't think they like trees. So we put together a mailer. We put together door hangers. We put together some digital advertisements. And we got together some emails. And our response rate was 6%, six times higher for our mailers than the direct mailers that they would get from a national nonprofit organization because we're planting trees to protect the water. Six times higher rate of response. Let's talk about digital advertising. Here we are on Facebook. This is an ad that appeared in my feed um, uh, saying that uh, housing prices are rising, I should sell my house. It's a good time to sell my house. Well, the industry average is that less than 1% of the people who are exposed to any particular Facebook ad are going to click on it. Less than 1%. Most of the time, those ads go out there and they are ignored. You ignore most of the Facebook ads you see, right? We all do. Less than 1% of the time do people click on those ads. But this is the Georgia Water Coalition, and they did some Facebook ads around the water. Farmers need clean water to grow our food. Time is running out to protect our water. And their click rate on those ads double, about double the national average of ads particularly. 
because it's about the water. So water pollution remains the top environmental concern in the United States, and that means when you take a water message to the people, they are more likely to notice it and respond to it than many of the messages they get about all of the other important things that people want their attention for. That's the good news. They are more likely to notice and respond to your water message than they are to all the dozens of other messages that arrive on any given day. So that's the good news. Now let's talk about the bad news. I'm afraid I have some for you. This is our 2022 National Waterways Literacy Survey. We did a big survey earlier this year here at Water Words That Work. And boy, the big takeaway from the survey is that uh, we've all had a rough couple of years. And here's a meme I found on the internet. My mental state in 2019, my mental state now. We are seeing results, seeing signs of this in our survey. So here's the bad news that I have for you. Um, we did the same survey back in 2015. We did it in 2022, and I'm seeing some slippage in some important areas. People are becoming discouraged. Um, I can take action to prevent water pollution and protect waterways. More than two thirds in 2015 slipped to 59% in 2022. There are actions we can take as a community to solve these problems. 85% in 2015 slips to 77% in 2022. The public is becoming discouraged about solutions. They're becoming discouraged about the solutions. They still think the problems are as important as they ever did, but they are becoming discouraged about the solutions. Here's another way of looking at that. Uh, the actions of a single person like me won't make any difference. Boy, is that a sad statement. But the number of people who agree with that has ticked up from 24%, one in four in 2015. Now we're at one in three in 2022. More and more people are reporting that they don't feel that they're, the things that they do really matter. There is nothing we can do to solve these problems. An even more depressing statement. Only about one in 10 agreed with that back in 2015, but now it's 2022. People are losing faith that their actions can make a difference. They are starting to lose faith that there are solutions, beginning to doubt that the things we hope that they will do will make a difference. And then we see how this translates into some slippage around the action. Voted for a candidate because of their environmental record or campaign promise, just a little slippage here. Supported a local environmental organization with time or money, a little bit of slippage here. Attended a public meeting about an environmental topic, a little bit of slippage here. The people are discouraged after two very, very, two and counting, very, very difficult years for all of us. So as you prepare to communicate with the general public, have you imagined how you're gonna get that first impression? What is the story you're going to tell? We need to start thinking hard about trying to be encouraging. Yes, we can. A winner is a dreamer who never gives up because people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Anything you can imagine, you can create. This kind of positive flavor is really missing from the stories that come out of the conservation community and it is more important than ever to remember to try to be inspiring and encouraging. Individually, we are one drop, but together we are an ocean. People feel these problems are huge. Show how we're working together to make that difference. Encourage them that it's not all on their shoulders. We're all gonna work together and we're all gonna get it done. So now let's talk about the good news again. I wanna go out on a high note because I know that's a lot to process. Let's think about Vicki and Randy and Sally and how the stories that we want. We want those more, more stories like that. And I know that this sequence of first exposure to first taste, to change of heart, to big, big contributions, it's different from the way y'all tend to think about dealing with the public. It's a stretch to 
try and get that first impression from someone you don't know. And it's a stretch to try and be very encouraging about how much of a difference that first taste makes. But it's worth the effort. So now here we are with the survey of Americans' outdoor recreation habits. And this was an astonishing finding that I think you will find bow heartening. So here was the question. Do you remember spending time outdoors with your family as a significant part of your childhood? A couple parts here. Do you remember spending time outdoors, time outdoors, time outdoors with your family, with your family? Now the people who answered yes to this question and the people who answered no to this question are very different. People who remember spending time outdoors with their family are more likely to report that they are completely satisfied with their family and friends than those who did not spend their childhood outside. Those who spend a lot of time outdoors with their family are more likely to report that they are completely satisfied with their career than those who do, do not remember this experience. Those who remember spending time outdoors with their family are much more likely to agree that they are completely satisfied with the quality of life. Think about that statement, completely satisfied with their quality of life. 37% for those who spend a lot of time outdoors with their family growing up, just 26% for those who do not have those memories. Happier, healthier lives start here. Happier, healthier lives start here. Happier, healthier lives start here. And that's the work that you are doing. The work that you do means happier and healthier lives for every child that grows up with memories of spending the summer on that lake. So never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. That, of course, is the famous quote from Margaret Mead. And I hope that uh, you are seeing that if we take this aspirational statement and we put a lot of data analysis to it, it confirms this inspiring aspirational statement. So thank you all for all that you do to change the world. I'm sorry I can't be there in person to answer your questions, but uh, I wish you all the best of luck with your work going forward. All right, I hope everyone enjoyed that presentation from Eric. I think his presentations are always worth watching any chance you have the opportunity. Um, as a reminder, if you have any specific questions for Eric, uh, please visit that link that is in the chat where it will take you to a form where you can um, type in your questions there. And then I will follow up with him afterwards and make sure that we get those answers back to you. All right, so moving on next, uh, I am going to be handing it back over to Katie so she can present to you all on some social media tips and tricks. Well, that was right up our alley as far as uh, the, the importance for communication and what we're focusing on today. Hopefully several of his comments resonated with you. I know they did with me. And one of the things that really um, the use of images that he had throughout his presentation, uh, some of the images that I have in my presentation are not nearly as dynamic, but you cannot, as they say, uh, underestimate the impact of a great photo. So what I want to talk today about is um, social media, and this is going to be a very basic primer, although I would be open to more in depth questions as we move along. Um, so he talked about how do we reach those larger audiences and social media, whether you like it or not, is definitely one of those tools to do so. So I'm going to move, I'm going to move over to the screen right now. And um, if I can move to that second slide. And so as you noticed, uh, when we promoted today's event, so we used several different approaches. 
um, some being social media, some being direct email. So you might have first heard about this uh, through a direct mail postcard, or you might have heard about it through an email, through constant contact, um, or you might have seen it on our Facebook. So this is a perfect example of one of the values to Lake Associations is to get people to uh, be aware of your events. Uh, social media is a great tool for that. So when we talk about social media, there are lots of different platforms. Uh, the one that I'm going to probably talk about the most today is Facebook because it's the one that has the greatest number of people using it. So if you look at this uh, post here, one of the things that we focus on, and hopefully you can see the details, um, is making sure that people have all the key information that they need when you use a post. So a post is, when you hear people talk about post, it actually is that information that you see in the email or in the, uh, on the screen right now in this context. Um, key things that I always encourage people to think about whenever you do a post and before you get ready to post is having that great image, whether a photograph, a chart, um, making sure that you have an impactful image and that that image, if it's about an event, that includes the key information for that event. People who use social media have uh, a very short attention span, oftentimes when they're going through things. And they also don't have a lot of tolerance for inaccuracies, misspellings, what have you. If you post things that aren't accurate, instead of getting more attention for the event, you're going to get more attention for your inaccuracies. And then you oftentimes get a whole string of comments about what's not right versus the actual event. So you really do want to make sure you've got all your information together ahead of time and keep it very succinct. Next slide. Um, so before you launch in to hold, hosting different applications for social media, um, you need to ask yourself a couple big questions. Um, one is, will your social media actually help grow your association, um, retain your membership? Is, you know, is that the goal of using social media for your Lake Association? And I think that you will find if you use social media um, effectively, it definitely could help. So I don't know where everybody's located today. I know I'm sitting in Boston right now, but I'm fully able to participate in this session. So regardless of where you are, you can reach people. Uh, the former organization I worked for, uh, we used to have a film festival before COVID and we would get um, about a thousand people that would participate in a week long event. Due to COVID, we went virtual and we ended up having people all over the country, in fact, all over the world participate. And we quadrupled our participation. And so now they offer that film festival, festival both virtually as well as live. So that's something to think about with, and I'm sure you're finding that with Zoom, we've all become more savvy to virtual presentations. Well, that's the power you get with social media. The one thing that's really critical though, if you're going to try to use it to communicate with your members and grow membership, is that your content be read, uh, readily available, um, that it's fresh and it's timely. If you put a post up a couple times a year or a couple times a month, you're going to lose your audience. And so it's really important to have a game plan within your association and I would recommend that you not necessarily depend on just one person. People need time out, they go on vacation, what have you. And so really putting together a team of people uh, to work on your social media. And in the social media app, such as Facebook or any of the different apps, they have different levels of people that you can have administer your site. Some of them can post, some of them can edit, some of them can actually block comments or remove comments. And so that's at the top level to have that right to administer your site. So usually that's retained for one or two people, but you actually want to have a team of people involved in posting for your social media, but just make sure that there's someone there that's monitoring it and checking for quality control. Next slide. 
So the other thing is who is your audience? If you know that your audience is not um, social media savvy or interested, if you know 90% of your audience doesn't participate in social media, you may wanna think about whether it's a good use of the time for your association. But the reality today is pretty much everybody, almost everybody is using some form of social media. And just because you don't um, register for Facebook or Instagram or what have you, it doesn't mean that you can't check it. Some people do not have friends, they do not actually register, but they still check the different apps. And so they may say, I don't do, so to speak, Facebook. That may mean that they haven't signed up, but it doesn't mean that they don't go and read it because you do not have to have an account to actually read it. Uh, next slide. So the next part is, does, do you have time as an association? Because it does take some time. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. If you set aside, perhaps it's an hour in total a week. Maybe it's a Sunday morning. You can post several different items during that time frame and schedule them to then uh, go live throughout the week. So you know that's one thing. Um, it's also pretty easy. And if you needed a one-on-one -on -one quick tutorial, um, I'd love to be able to do that if, uh, if that's the case, but it really is pretty self-explanatory. And as they say about everything now, you can go on YouTube and get a very basic uh, tutorial on how to post things. I'll tell you a few things right now. Um, if you go into social media, you'll see if you're an administrator, that's the first thing that you have to become. And you do need to have an email address to be um, to administer a site. So that's one of the first things you have to check to make sure. Um, but as far as the time and ability, I think it's good to have someone um, in your association who tends to go to all the events, be your official photographer, and that they know how to take photos that's not just the back of people's heads. So there's nothing like seeing lots of photos that shows everybody's bald spot. You really wanna make sure that they know how to capture a good photo that shows the action or the humor or the essence of what you're doing. So having someone who just focuses on the photography and then they need to save those photos in what's called a JPEG format. It's a very simple format. There's two that make it easy to post. One is ping and one is JPEG. If they save it as a PDF, it makes it more difficult to post it quickly. So those are, I know those are technical terms for some, but it, it's very, you know, it's the extension that you will see at the end of your file. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits of social media? I mentioned promoting events. So in a lot of apps, they have a specific event page. And so the nice thing about posting your event on that event page is that that keeps an ongoing list and it allows, it has a format that requires you to put different pieces of information in there. And so you don't forget things like the date, the time, the location, if it costs anything. So it's really helpful to have that event. And then when you refer to it in emails or on your website or what have you, you can use that link to that event in other posts so that they always have that information readily available. The other wonderful thing about social media is it allows you to recognize your members and accomplishments of the association. Um, if you, you have a new report coming out, maybe you just uh, finished a big outdoor event, a cleanup activity or what have you, if someone's taking those pictures, then you within a few minutes can post those pictures online. And that's a great way to grow your number of followers People love to see pictures of people they know and quite frankly, themselves. So it's a great way to kind of toot your own horn, but also um, build a stronger following. And for people to understand that you're more than just an organization that gets together and has regular board meetings or deals with paperwork, that you're actually out there doing good things. It's also a great way to educate people. If it's not about an event or some fun activity, making sure that you include a, a tight nugget of 
fascinating information. Maybe it's about a particular water quality indicator that you found that day, um, a macroinvertebrate or something that is fascinating and people may not see all the time. Getting that good photo and giving them a nice snippet of information. They love that kind of information. It's also a great way to recruit volunteers. And, it's, uh, and social media has also become a fun way to raise money. You can do all kinds of things by raising money. Maybe your association is looking to purchase a specific piece of equipment and it has a set price of $1,000. You can quickly get a fundraising campaign up on social media to raise that $1,000. It's helpful if you line up someone who's willing to match so it becomes a challenge. So say in Facebook, you would do a fundraising campaign and they have all the buttons on there to set it up. And then you tell them that if you raise $500, you have such and such a business that's going to match that for another $500. That gets great traction for social media. You've probably seen those for birthdays as well. So it's also a quick way to reach a much broader audience. You just saw from the previous presentation that you can meet, reach millions of people through social media, but you know, to do direct mail, it's, it's fairly expensive. And you know, for 500 people that you reach, you know, if you get a one or 2% response rate, you're doing very well. So social media has that benefit of being inexpensive as well. Next slide, please. So just as an example, uh, this is our volunteer event we just had a few weeks ago. And by posting actual photos of the people who attended, we had close to 500 people follow this particular post. So that's a, you know, another way of keeping people engaged. They see that they went to the event and you've got this, so it's immediate interaction and reinforcement, but it's also fun. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges with social media um, include keeping the content fresh, timely, and accurate. As I mentioned, if your, your information is not accurate, you will have people immediately respond and it can become a long chain reaction and that's not necessarily what you want. So you have to make sure that you have fresh, timely, accurate content. The other thing is having someone monitor your, your social media page. So if it's a Facebook page or it's Instagram or what have you, but I think that's particularly true in Facebook. Um, people can if you don't watch your site regularly, someone can make a post that has nothing to do with your association. And then that can take off and they really kind of steal your, your page from you. And sometimes it's not very savory information. So you do need to have someone who's regularly monitoring your page. Um, the other thing, so how do you deal with comments and hackers? Um, that monitor, the person who administrates uh, your site, they have the ability to block someone, you can report someone, all of those tools are readily available. Uh, as far as comments, the general rule of thumb, especially if you're working um, for a public entity, is that you try to be respectful of people's genuine comments and concerns and be responsive be polite, but never get into an all out back and forth battle on social media. It's, that's not the best forum to do it. And in fact, the more you respond sometimes, especially if it's negative, you're feeding that conversation and it, it attracts more people. So there are times when people have a concern and then, you know, in my experience, I've reached out to them by phone. I've tried to deal with their issues directly and see if we can resolve it, but not get into a back and forth online. So the other thing you want to do is, you know, be able to find someone who feels comfortable or willing to learn so that they can provide that ongoing technical support. Uh, you don't want to get in a situation where you have something going on with your page and then there's no one around who knows how to access it. One of the things I always tell people is to try to set things up as generically as possible. Instead of setting up accounts in social media using individuals' names and passwords, 
make that part of a policy for your association. For instance, maybe it would be administer uh, or administrator at Tip of the Mint Watershed Council, not Katie Wolf at Tip of the Mint Watershed Council. So you use a generic name to do that. And that way, when people send inquiries and things, it's not going to an individual. One of the reasons that's so important is if that person leaves your organization and they take with it their email address and their passwords, then you may have a very difficult time accessing that ever again. So you really wanna think upfront about how you set up your account and whose names are affiliated with it, as well as phone numbers, because now everything has security checks and you have to go back and you know they'll text message you or they'll send you an email. And if you don't have access to that person, you may lose a, uh, access to your page. Uh, the other part is having those clear, appropriate photographs. Um, if you don't have that attraction to your post, then you're, you're going to sometimes just waste your time. And so making sure that you do have someone who knows how to hold a phone uh, steady and that the photos they're taking are appropriate. And um, I would never post something that I felt like the person in the picture would not feel comfortable with. I think that's really important um, because you may get a negative result instead of you know, the positive results you're trying to achieve. The last thing um, is staying up to date with what's going on. The um, applications like Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, they're always updating and particularly adding new security aspects. Uh, Any more social media is under a lot of uh, criticism under the microscope. There's a lot of legislation and uh, other matters that are looking at how you in, uh, force security. And so you wanna stay on top of those things. Typically the, the app itself, the people who develop the app keep people informed. But if you ignore that, you might find yourself um, locked out if you don't take uh, necessary steps when they inform you that you need to update information. Next slide, please. Um, so there are, we talked about the different apps. Uh, when they talk about apps, it means applications. So you have Facebook, which is the largest application at 2.8 billion monthly users. That's in the world. Next is YouTube, then WhatsApp. WhatsApp is a um, often it's similar to Facebook Messenger and people use it all over the world. When my daughter was working in Bangladesh and Jordan, it was a secure, easy way for us to communicate with each other. Um, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Those are all at the top. For associations, I think Facebook and YouTube are definitely important. You can link your Facebook to Instagram and Twitter. And so when you post on Facebook, it will automatically generate a post on Instagram and Twitter. So that makes it very easy. That's how we do it with Tip of the Mitt. Um, some of those other apps are a little more controversial. Uh, Twitter uh, is, a lot of people are examining their use of that right now due to ways that it's been used for uh, not so productive outcomes. And so, you know, you want to think about that. How much do you want to weigh into that world? YouTube, though, is a great tool and it does interface nicely with Facebook. Um, you can easily uh, include a link to a YouTube video. And as you know, that's how everybody is finding out how to learn how to do things today, whether it's fixing your vacuum cl uh, cleaner or uh, learning how to uh, monitor water. Uh, those are all vehicles that you can easily educate people on using YouTube. Next slide, please. So just some basic tips for effective postings. Being concise and accurate. I keep hitting on that, but that's very important. Uh, making sure that if you have any kind of events that you include the date, time, a registration link, the exact address or virtual link, the targeted audience and the, the cost. Those are all things that people look for. And if you don't include it, you're gonna get questions one after the other for that, or they get frustrated and they just leave. So make sure you have that checklist when you post events. Making sure that your visuals are always 
crisp, clean, and uh, appropriate. And then beginning with a catchy question or opening so that you engage people. Think about that clever way that you can get people engaged. And humor is a great way to do that. Next slide. So I talked about you know, humor, funny shots. Of course, we know that babies, puppies, sunrises and sunsets always get attention. If you find that people aren't following your site, I have to tell you, it's a good trick. Uh, if you have um, you know, a nice lab retrieving something out of the lake or a baby taking her first dip in the water just to grab people's attention and build your audiences, they, it definitely works. It might sound corny, but it does work. When you do use photographs, it is important to give credit to the photographer, particularly if it's not part of your um, Facebook posting or social media posting team. Um, and always make sure you get permission if you borrow photos or use quotes. Some of them are copyrighted. Typically, if you include the photographer in a link to that person's site, um, they see that as a compliment, but you do wanna make sure before you uh, borrow somebody's photograph that you're not doing something that's illegal. And I always tell people, if you have any doubts about any content, leave it out. Um, stay clear. You may think something's funny, but somebody else may find it offensive. So if you have any hesitation of whether it's appropriate uh, or true, leave it out, stay away from it. It's, it's better to not go there than cause a controversy, unless that would be your intent. Next slide, please. This is just an example. Um, it was just my birthday and I wanted to thank people. As you can see, that photo grabs your attention. It's just a, a, you know, an example of how photos can uh, draw people to your site. Next slide, please. Um, additional tips. Um, it's fun when you have an event to post photo collections. Photo collections are a great way to drive up audiences on your social media. Again, people love to see the people they know, but it's also a way of including people, engaging them and having other people see their neighbors and friends being involved in what you're doing and then maybe get enticed to become a volunteer or a member. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can also schedule things out. So maybe you're going on vacation for two weeks you can set up your post two weeks in advance and then in a, it will typically advise you when the time is to have the most viewers. And so, you know, it, it helps you in that process. On Facebook, there is a publishing component that makes it very easy. And so you don't have to do it right before things. You can schedule it in advance. I mentioned earlier also how you can connect the different apps, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and even YouTube so that instead of having to populate multiple sites, you could just have to populate one. Next slide. So this is a, a recent post for a Tip of the Mitt, and it was promoting our mobile boat program. And so you'll see the up close shot of the, I think that might be a crayfish there, and then how the actual mobile boat program uh, is working in action. And that information lists all the upcoming mobile boat washing programs um, hopefully you'll go on our Facebook and check it out and participate. But that's just an example of how you have a photo to kind of grab people's attention, but you make sure you include all the details. Also, if you look to the far right of that screen, you're going to see an item that says publishing, publishing tools. It's, uh, it's four little icons down. You'll see publishing tools. That's where you can find all the tools for setting up your Facebook post and connecting it to, uh, to Twitter or Instagram or a link in a YouTube video or adding photos. You can create a gallery. All of those tools are very easy and right there. So it's pretty straightforward. Next slide, please. So um, tips for effective posting, I'll, uh, just a few more here. I mentioned having an online fundraiser in which you set a goal and a time frame. Um, you can do things like photo contest, um, poster contest to help build audiences. So that's the big thing at first with Facebook, you have to build up a certain number of friends. 
that's where you tap into your membership and you urge them to go and follow or like your page. Once you get so many people listed, then you can start going live with your page. But those are tools, those fun activities are a way to get people involved. Um, another thing that is great for Facebook, if you're having like a polar jump or fishing tournaments or what have you, to you know, do it Facebook Live, where you can have, use your Facebook, your little smartphone, and you capture it live, and it shows on Facebook at the same time, and it helps engage people who may not be there at the time or wish they were there. So again, it's a way to make it interactive and fun for folks. Next slide. So just as to run back over, uh, how do you handle negative posts again? Um, you do wanna have a policy up front. You wanna think about that. Um, do you take down negative posts? Um, if they're inappropriate, um, if they slam somebody, if they have nothing to do with your site, um, it may be best to just block that person um, or reach out to them through messenger and communicate with them, but tell them that, you know, this site is for public use and um, its goal is to educate the public to not necessarily have negative discourse um, so that you try to, so to speak, take them offline, but you don't necessarily do it live on the post. You don't want to feed the fire, so to speak. Um, if people are consistently rude and inappropriate and offensive, then you can report them um, to the social media app and you can also easily block them. But always, if people sometimes have very genuine concerns. With Tip of the Mint, we have you know, people who let us know about different issues and things. And so we try to be very responsive and polite and respectful of their concerns and opinions, even when they may not align with ours. Next slide. Next slide, okay. So lastly, um, I think it's important to have fun and you know, the two things, fun and being informative with social media. Obviously you can use it for very serious purposes. Maybe you have, for us, you know, we have new reports coming out. We had a, a nice collection of septic solution materials coming out. It was a great way to get that word out to folks. So it can be very, very informative, but you do want to try to cultivate a positive, upbeat culture so that people come back to your site, so that they know that they can depend on you for reliable, informative information, or that they can um, see what's going on and feel, uh, get, uh, be uplifted or in the loop. Those are the types of things that you wanna encourage with your social media page. So that's pretty much everything um, in a nutshell. Uh, there are more details to it, but I just wanted to kind of give everybody a primer. I realize many of you may be experts well beyond my capabilities. So um, hopefully that was helpful. Thank Any you very questions? much, Katie. Yes, um, we do have uh, one question in the chat right now. It says, if your organization has a page they want to administrate, is there a different app outside of Facebook that people have to use? And what is the difference or pros or cons of having a group on Facebook versus a page for your organization? So you want to have, um, I think I, as I mentioned earlier, trying to have it based on your organization uh, is better for the long run because it stays with the organization instead of the individual. And there are benefits offered to organizations that aren't offered to individuals. So I would encourage people to go in that direction. The, the apps do require verification. So it will take you, you need to have a little lead time to set that up because they will wanna verify that you truly exist. Uh, the other thing though that is, is important is always thinking about that action item. And so if you have a page on using a social media app, you want to always be driving them to your website as a way to grow interest and a following for your website. So including your website link there, um, not necessarily giving them every piece of information on your post, keeping that concise, but if they want more information, then include the link to your website so that you build that close relationship. That way you're teasing them a little bit with social media, but then you're driving them to your website where they can get more information. I hope that answers. <laughs> 
think so. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from Katie? You have the option to either type your question into the chat or you can use the raise my hand feature and you can ask it in person. Thank you. Okay. I'm not seeing any. All right, thank you, Katie. We will move on to our next present presentation. Um, so just to, so everyone is aware, the Watershed Council is working um, on a website update, a much needed website update um, that's still very much under development, but we're very excited about it. Um, Caroline is gonna be showing you a glimpse of kind of what one of the new tools we'll be using as. So Caroline Keeson is our monitoring programs coordinator and she is responsible for our volunteer programs and monitoring efforts. Caroline joined the Watershed Council in 2018, and she earned a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Studies and Agri-Science from Michigan State University, and has spent the last 12 years in the world of water quality monitoring. So with that, Caroline, take it away. All right, thanks, Lauren. Uh, so I'm gonna share a little bit about some of our monitoring programs, and then I'm actually going to work with uh, Bill Howard, who's been helping us with our website and our new database system to show off how some of this is going to work. So I'm going to share, I've got a couple maps here for us to look at. Okay. I don't, is that, is it going? I think it is. I'm not seeing anything. Okay. It says stop. There we go. You're good. Okay. Working. Okay. So we've got a couple different programs that we want to highlight here. Uh, we have our comprehensive uh, water quality monitoring program where we monitor 55 lakes and rivers every three years. And we've been doing that since 1987. Um, so this is a, a really large data set. You know, it's a little bit different from our volunteer programs in that it's uh, the field work is, is performed by staff, and then we also monitor for more parameters. So we are looking at nutrients. Uh, we take out our multi-parameter probe and get uh, measurements for temperature, dissolved oxygen, conductivity. So it's a little more rigorous than our volunteer programs, but it doesn't happen as often, um, and it only happens in the spring. So this is kind of um, uh, just a different kind of monitoring, uh, but it's still a good way for us to identify water quality issues. Uh, we use this data a lot when we are looking at where to do restoration activities, where do we need education outreach, things like that. So the next map I have is our volunteer lake monitoring program. And we have been, we've had uh, volunteers out monitoring lakes actually since 1974. Uh, we didn't really get a super coordinated program until 1986. And so currently we have 27 lakes in that volunteer lakes monitoring program. And uh, I think there's over 30 sites. So some of those lakes have more uh, sites than just one. Um, and so our volunteer lake monitors are out there usually once a week, sometimes every other week. And they are collecting data uh, from May through August. And some of you probably on the call have returned your samples. So, you know, this is a data set that also has, uh, you know, many decades of information uh, and it's a little more frequent than some of our other monitoring that our staff can perform. So we can't forget our streams. We have uh, volunteer stream monitors and then we also have our Watershed Academy. So I think we have, um, I think we're doing it right. Currently we're at about 22 rivers, I think, and it's about double the amount of sites. And so our stream monitoring actually began in 2004. Uh, so we have quite a bit of data on the streams also, and that involves uh, probably over 50 volunteers. Watershed Academy has seen, I think, over a thousand since we started doing that. Uh, and then we also have a avian botulism program where we are looking at uh, bird mortality on the Emmett County shoreline. So the reason why I'm sharing these maps with you, and I'm actually gonna stop sharing, uh, is to show you, you know, the breadth of some of our programs that we really cover a large area in Northern Michigan. 
Uh, you know, we have a few different programs with different uh, parameters, different ways to collect the information, lots of people are involved. And then, you know, really the major point here is that we have a lot of data. And so the question is, you know, what is the best way to manage some of that? And what is the best way to share that with all of you? And so we've been working uh, with the downstream project and maybe Bill will do a quick introduction about um, the downstream project. And they have a tool called Water Reporter that we are actually moving our database over to. And so we're gonna show you uh, a couple examples of how uh, you'll be able to access our data, uh, use it for your own presentations um, or just information. And then we'll talk a little bit about how our volunteers and uh, the public can contribute to our database in an online format too. Uh, so Bill, do you have the capability to share your screen? I, I do. And okay. um, I first wanted to show off my uh, Walloon Lake Village store t-shirt. It's a collector's item now, I think. Okay. It officially closed this past weekend. So passing of a great, great legacy. Um, I, I just brief introduction for me. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Downstream Project. We've been around since 2007. Uh, we're a conservation communications firm, and um, we do website development, and we've incorporated our Water Watch program, which is a, a way of using the tools developed by the Commons, uh, a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. Uh, Water Reporter is a uh, uh, funded by some very major foundations, and so the adoption of this for uh, Tip of the Mitt will serve you know, great benefits down the road. They'll They'll benefit from updates and, and new ways of visualizing and analyzing data. Uh, we've been through a fairly extensive discovery process with, um, uh, with Tip of the Mitt in terms of their objectives and their programs. Uh, I am overwhelmed and, and so impressed with all the work that they do. Capturing that in a new website is going to be a challenge for all of us. And, um, but this morning, what we wanted to do was just uh, highlight um, how Water Reporter is going to be integrated into, into the website. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, again, the website is in beta format. But we, we really don't anticipate rolling this out until early spring. Uh, there's a lot to be done uh, curating data. But um, you will get uh, a little bit of a sneak preview. Uh, and Caroline, I will turn it back over to you if you want to walk them through um, where we're headed with, with Water Reporter. Sure. So this is our going to be our main uh, homepage where we've got it split out into some of our main programs, projects, uh, the things that we're working on currently. And at the bottom, we will have uh, the option for people to sign up to become a Water Reporter. Uh, which is a way for them to, you know, see what kind of information is being reported, but also uh, they may want to um, put in some of their own information if there are volunteers or part of uh, a campaign also. So on this homepage, it's similar to uh, what we have now, uh, where you'll be able to click on, um, click and get information on certain lakes in northern Michigan. So we're going to go to the Inland Lakes next. And I think we're gonna do Walloon Lake first. And so of course we'll have to populate this with quite a few more lakes. All right now we have two ready to go. So yeah, Walloon. And so this is you know also a little bit similar to our current website in that there is a you know there's the statistics of each lake, the known aquatic invasive species, others uh, a description. Uh, we've noticed uh, that people, you know, will often refer to these web pages. So we are going to keep a lot of the descriptors. Uh, but then at the bottom, there will be a map that is linked to our database uh, where you can actually see, you know, what's the water quality of a particular lake. And so you can access that by, I think eventually you'll be able to click on that thumbnail, but for now, uh, full page view will work. And so each lake will have a map 
where um, you'll be able to see the water quality sites that are related to that lake. Uh, so this is Walloon Lake. This uh, lake straddles uh, both Charlevoix and Emmett counties. And we are going to look at some of our comprehensive water quality data. Um, so this map, you can see Bill it is, Bill is using it, it's interactive. You can scroll, you can zoom in, uh, you can click around. There is a legend on the left that explains uh, what we're actually looking at. And so I think we're gonna look at total phosphorus first. And so total phosphorus is being displayed. Um, we've got the threshold. So you know we've talked about uh, total phosphorus a lot. And total phosphorus is one of those nutrients that it's okay in really small amounts, but if there's too much, if, it, if it's there in excess, uh, it, you know, a lake can actually kind of go into overdrive and there can be too much algae or too many plants. And we as humans are often the contributors to total phosphorus. So if we click on that little card, we can see what the total phosphorus has been doing on, on this particular station on Wallen Lake uh, since the 90s. And this is a trend that we see a lot on lakes in Northern Michigan where the total phosphorus is higher uh, in the 90s. And then, you know, we think that it is lower over time because of the invasion of zebra mussels and sometimes even quagga mussels on some of the inland lakes that are connected. And so this is a trend that we see in a lot of areas. Um, and you can, if you can kind of see that it's, it's color coded too. So the green dots are showing that the results indicate that Walloon Lake is natural. Um, the result is not above a, a threshold that would make the water quality bad. Uh, one thing to point out too is that with each of these parameters, um, we have the ability to customize the uh, descriptions. And so for visitors to the site, uh, we're educating them as to what total phosphorus is and why we monitor for it and what, what it's an indicator of. So uh, an important educational tool. Uh, we're going to look at chloride next. So chloride is a salt. It can come from road salt. Uh, we can see it in things uh, like fertilizer runoff, septic runoff. So this is another one of those parameters that we look at and we're, we're using it as an indicator of human influences. And so we've uh, collected chloride uh, since the early 90s also. And you can see that the chloride has actually been rising on Wallen Lake, which is also something that is really typical of lakes in Northern Michigan. Uh, but the main thing to see here is that not, not only is the trend increasing, but the lake is still considered natural because the levels are still very low. And so you can see in the upper right, there's a red dot to show chron a chronic toxicity level of anything over 230 milligrams per liter. And Walloon is nowhere near that. And you know, no, no waters in this area are, um, but this is a good way to show visually that our waters are in good health. And beyond the water quality data that we can show in Water Reporter, we also have the ability to look at uh, posts made by uh, people that are part of the app. So I don't if you want to turn on the Water Reporter post. No, so this is. Uh, there are two aspects to Water Reporter. One is obviously the data management. The other side is the anecdotal uh, posts that can be made by you uh, and, and anyone who wants to join uh, Tip of the Mitt on Water Reporter. And, and it's available for your organization as well. So if we toggle the Water Reporter posts, uh, I just have a couple of sample posts here from, from a, a few years ago, but when I, when I first started, but uh, there are lots of possibilities here, especially with campaigns where you might be doing cormorant sightings, you might do, be doing avian botulism studies, you can create custom campaigns. Uh, Water Reporter is, a, is an application for your iPhone or Android. 
it takes a geolocated image and there's uh, it can, you can fill out uh, a custom form or just freeform text your observations. So it can be used in many, many uh, creative ways. And we'll get a, into that a little bit in, in the breakout session. Um, interestingly, this post will also take you to um, the Water Reporter community page, um, give you a little bit more uh, depth. It could also be a conversation, uh, you know, as, as this movement grows in, in this region, uh, people can respond to the post. It's sort of a niche social media, if you will. And uh, it, it has a, a lot of creative potential, um, especially when it comes to you know, maybe it's a trash sighting or something like that for a pickup. And you can, you can bore down even further and uh, it will give you directions um, to, to the location uh, where, uh, where that uh, post was taken. Okay, so, so next, yep, next we're going to look at Burt Lake and we're going to show off some of our volunteer lake monitoring data. Um, so this is the data set that's been collected some, in some places since the 70s, it's, it's uh, pretty extensive. So this is Burt Lake in Sheboygan County. And uh, our lake monitors, they collect chlorophyll A, which is a, it's an indicator of algae. It's actually looking at um, how much pigment is in the water. And so this we can use to uh, figure out how much productivity is in a lake. So if there's more chlorophyll A, more pigment, we can assume there's more algae. There may be, there may be more nutrients associated with that. If there's less, uh, we can assume that uh, the water quality is, is a little bit better. Um, there's less productivity and possibly less nutrients. And so we have three sites on Burt Lake. Uh, currently, the most southern site is, is the most active. So we're going to click on that one. And so, um, you know, we've got the green to mark oligotrophic, which is the clearest uh, state. Uh, for a lake in terms of productivity. And then if we click on chlorophyll A, we can actually see um, these are all individual results. So this is, you know, every two weeks over a summer. And that's a lot of information. So it's nice to be able to see it all in one chart. Um, you know, easy to read. Everything that's kind of on the lower end of the chart is in green. So that's, that's showing that Burt Lake was oligotrophic at those times. And then we've kind of got the purple in the middle, which is um, showing that the lake was mesotrophic. So it has a little bit more nutrients, a little bit more algae, uh, still really good. And um, eventually, you know, we will be able to uh, have our lake monitors input data into this uh, system uh, quicker. So right now, you know, we are ac actually collecting data from 2022 right now. So we're receiving all that information and it's in, a, it's in a paper hard copy format. So there's a lot of data entry, data analysis that has to happen before you can see it. And so this kind of cuts out one of those steps for us uh, to make it a little bit faster uh, so that we can you know, show off the good work that our volunteers are doing and so that everyone is aware of what kind of water quality we can expect in our waters. Uh, so next we're gonna look at the Secchi disc. And so this one also has quite a few um, data points. Uh, so this is a parameter that is collected every week and it's also color coded just the same as uh, the chlorophyll A uh, where the Mesotrophic is in purple, so that's a little bit, uh, a little bit more nutrients, a little bit more algae, and then the oligotrophic is the green, so that's the clearest, um, the clearest lakes and the deepest Secchi dip depths, so the most most transparent waters. And so what's interesting about these two parameters is that sometimes they'll be showing two different things. So the Secchi disk might say that the lake is mesotrophic, and the chlorophyll A might say that it is oligotrophic. 
and you know we'll be able to map those two things together so that you can see you know what's the overall status of the lake. Okay, I think that's all I had for Bert Lake. Um, so next, I think we want to uh, show how we how people can become a water reporter. So uh, right now, the Watershed Council is working on getting all of our historical data into this database. And as we're doing that, we're creating templates so that our volunteers will, will also be able to enter data into this. And so we're going to show how you, how a volunteer or um, even a citizen, anyone who wants to join our community can uh, become a water reporter. So this will be on our website. Um, it's, this is an app that you can download to your smartphone. You can also use it on a computer too. Um, you just have you and you and you always have the capability of um, you know geolocating where your observation is being taken. So maybe you're taking a picture of a stream. You know maybe there's a, a beaver dam that you're concerned about. You can report it on this app. Uh, maybe there's a particular algae that you're not sure about. And so the cool thing is if your neighbors are also uh, using this and, or maybe some other people on your lake and they're seeing the same algae, you know, the Watershed Council staff may be able to say, well, this is not just, you know, uh, related to a small area, maybe this is a larger issue. So um, we'll be able to kind of look at the water quality data and the water reporter posts from our community, the crowdsourced posts at the same time. Bill, is there anything else you should want to uh, add on the uh, We, you know, certainly we encourage uh, folks to to try it out now uh, and join uh, Tip of the Mitt um, and and just practice. Uh, we'll put this into greater use uh, next next spring. But uh, you, you'll note that when you join and and sign up for a free account, uh, you can join your watershed. Um, uh, your, the, the Watershed Association. In the future, we'll be using uh, a hashtag system. So for certain campaigns, it might be uh, hashtag wildlife. And we can generate uh, independent maps uh, for those hashtags. So it might be hashtag, uh, you know, stream bank uh, uh, degradation or um, uh, trash um, or erosion. Um, so we can, we can have have targeted campaigns. So lots of potential future use for, for Water Reporter. All right, we do have a couple questions in the chat if you guys are ready for those. Sure. Okay. Now uh, the first one is, can the location be available to the administrators but not the general public? Yes. Um, in, in terms of a, a Water Reporter post? Yes. Yes. Um, the, um, there is a, a monitoring function for the post, much like social media, it can be, the, the post can be approved or disapproved. Um, so they can be kept private. Okay. And the you, same and goes, one, one more thing to add, the same goes for data too. So, you know, if you upload a picture, someone has to approve that before it gets posted. If you, input a secchi depth, um, you know, I will have to look at that and basically check a box to say that it's going to go through. Good. All right, do you incorporate data from, from North, from the North, oh my gosh, excuse me, the Northwest Health Department into this model and for that matter, any other organizations? The, um... Water Reporter is an open source application. So there's an API that allows, um, if, if we go back to, it's a two-way street here, and this is an under, under development as well. If you look at the data, um, if you'll see in the upper right-hand corner here, there's a download um, icon that will allow you to, to download and um, 
work with the data from Walloon Lake on your own. It'll be in an Excel format. Um, there are several uh, data sources that we can pull into Water Reporter, um, including USGS flow gauges, um, weather. Um, we're working on a, a, the API now to, to, to get this data to EPA um, through the Water Data Collaborative. There's a movement to standardize the way volunteer groups report their data so that there can be more effective interchange uh, with organizations like like uh, Northwest Health. Does that answer your question? Uh, I believe it does. Um, and Larry, if that didn't, um, feel free to type into the chat. Um, next question is, will the app be just for iPhone or also Samsung? Now this is, this is uh, the App Store and Google Play Store, and Android and, um, and iPhone. Okay. And as a follow-up to the first question, how does one communicate with the administrator that one would prefer the location not to be included in the public post? I would say either put it put the post in the middle of the lake or don't use put it on water reporter. It sounds like that's a more private thing. Yes, and so I would say if it's something that, you know, someone wants just the Watershed Council to know, I would encourage that to be emailed to us. Um, and then in terms of other data, uh, what about BeachGuard? Yeah, so Larry, BeachGuard, I mean, you've been on that website. It's a little clunkier than this one. Um, so at the moment, these two databases would not talk to each other. However, there are some databases and maybe Bill can explain more, but for instance, like the USGS, uh, the station gauges, we can add that to, um, we can add that to our uh, water reporter map. So I think it's, I don't, I don't know how that works, Bill. Is it if they're part of the water reporter community or, um, I don't know there, there are several great examples of how this has been used. Um, uh, the James River Association has a has a water watch program where they're they're putting in beach conditions and 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 swim conditions, uh, giving a, using the grading system of of A to F. Um, the first goal here is to get the data into Water Reporter, and then we can look at at different ways of of sharing that information. Several organizations, including the Riverkeeper Network, um, is is using Water Reporter data and the API to export to uh, SwimGuide, which is a, a Canadian-based company that um, produces a, uh, a a report, which I'm assuming is like BeachGuard. Um, I think there's a real potential here to customize Water Reporter to do that function uh, in, in in the tip of the map. Great. So other than displaying volunteer lake monitoring data, how will Tip of the Mint begin to use the water reporter on the website? I don't know who's best to answer that, but I would say, you know, we'll definitely be using it for campaigns. If anyone's familiar with our Clean Waters Challenge campaign, uh, we had people go out to different rivers and streams and clean up on those areas and we'll be able to track and report that uh, on something like Water Reporter. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else in the office wants to weigh in on that. Well, I, I can add just a little bit in terms of, of um, if you are a designated monitor for a specific <laughs> campaign, let's say it's for uh, the avian botulism study, there's a little form for you to fill out, and we'll have a we'll have a custom page um, for the anecdotal posts uh, for the, for avian botulism or for the cormorant sightings. And um, when you submit that post, uh, the geolocated image and uh, the the data will be available on a on a custom map. And that so the. It's only limited by your imagination what kind of campaigns we can develop and how we could activate volunteers 
uh, to participate. Uh, only limited by your imagination. All right. We have one more question and then we're gonna move on. Um, will you be using this for HABs reporting? That is a good question. Um, I would only want to use for HABs reporting if immediately EGLE got the report. And so for some of these emergency issues, you know, I'm not sure if Water Reporter is going to be the best thing. Uh, because we need to respond immediately. So I would not say, you know, at, at the moment, I can't say that this is going to be the best way to get those emergency issues. In front of I, I will say, I, I will say that Water Reporter uh, is being used extensively for HABs reporting in other areas. And, and the, but that's up to the individual organization. Yeah. I, I guess, Bill, a question for you, is there a way to alert a staff person when a report is made? All the reports are actionable and it's possible to set up designated people uh, within the community who, who respond to reports. Um, right. the, the Riverkeeper Network uh, is, is extensively involved in Water Reporter and they, they get involved with individual organizations and they will actually indicate whether an action has been um, uh, taken on a specific post. So these, right. these can be real actionable alerts. Yeah, I guess the thing would be is if we can get someone who's outside of the community to, to see that because the state is not going to be, you know, part of our organization on Water Reporter. Uh, the the uh, Shenandoah Riverkeeper used Water Reporter extensively for um, uh, what they called the Respect the Shenandoah campaign, and it was strictly for algal blooms, and because they're trying to get the Shenandoah delisted for for algae, which is not currently uh, uh, on their list. So they were able to not only create over 200 images and posts on algal blooms. But that's also a downloadable report with with geolocated images that they were able to submit uh, in their case. So it's it can be a very important tool for things like that. All right. Well, thank you very much, Caroline and Bill. As everyone can tell, we still have you know there's a lot of possibilities for us, and we're still very early in the process. So um, I appreciate that presentation. So we're.